our kids, kids team amazing? I think they're amazing. And our youth team were involved, everybody. In fact, everybody you saw on the stage, our coordinators for kids and youth for Next Gen were all present and they just did a fantastic job. So I'm gonna talk for just a short time. We're not gonna have a regular length. We're gonna try to let you out by about hopefully 11.20 so you can go get some title treat snacks in the lobby. Because we want you to have a full experience. I know, I knew you would enjoy that part. So <laughs> anyway, why do kids matter? Why do kids matter? Kids matter, and we spend this kind of time and energy and money because kids matter to Jesus. So because they matter to Jesus, they matter to us. And this was such an inspiring week for me to watch the kids leaders, the youth leaders that we have here at Mesa Church engage our kids, engage our youth, learn about Jesus being a forever friend. He's always with you. It was really a sweet experience. I want to take a passage of scripture, a story that I think a lot of you probably are familiar with. And I'm going to read it and just dissect it a little bit and try to connect it to the heart that Mesa Church has for children because it's the heart that Jesus and God himself has for children. It's from Mark 10, 13 through 16. One day some parents brought their children to Jesus so he could touch them and bless them. But the disciples scolded the parents for bothering him. When Jesus saw what was happening, he was angry with his disciples. He said to them, let the children come to me. Don't stop them. For the kingdom of God belongs to these children and to those who are like these children. I tell you the truth, anyone who doesn't receive the kingdom of God like a child will never enter it. Then he took the children in his arms and he placed his hands on their heads and he blessed them. Dear Father in heaven, would you teach us this morning? We've already been taught by our kids, by our, our, our youth, by the adults, those who served at VBS. We ask that now in a new scripture, a different part of the passage of, uh, in the book of Mark, that you would teach us as well. What is your heart? We, obviously, you love children and you want us to become like children. Would you teach us this morning in Jesus' name? Amen. You know, it was a common practice in the ancient Middle Eastern world for parents to bring their children to a rabbi to have him bless them. Very common. So this wasn't really a surprise to the disciples. This was very popular. And by this point, Jesus was pretty well known. In fact, he couldn't really go into a village without being swarmed. So he was well known. And, and even though it's a common practice, we see that you know, the disciples are resisting it. Mark even uses a general term for children, but in the book of Luke, in fact, this story is in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. In the book of Luke, Luke uses the term brephe, and it means little ones, babies and toddlers. So can you imagine later in the last verse in 16, it says that Jesus took them in his arms. Can you just imagine that image of Jesus swooping these babies and these toddlers into his arms? A couple days ago, our, our toddler, Lennon, came to VBS, and she was up here in worship with this whole group, and she saw me sitting over there, and she ran to me. And what did I do? I squatted as far as I could. <laughs> I squatted, and I scooped her up in my arms because that's a natural response, and that's our Lord Jesus who did that with these children. But the disciples are resisting it. They're rebuking the parents. They're angry with the parents for bringing the children, which again is hard to understand because it's such a common practice. They're angry. In fact, I tend to think, and a couple of the commentators felt like the disciples, because of Jesus' popularity and become so well-known, that they were beginning to think a little more elite, right? They had this elitism thing going on where, you know, Jesus doesn't have time for the insignificant. He doesn't really have time for those within society who don't matter. Now, even though we know that parents in the ancient world love their children, children didn't really bring a lot of economic value. They were consumers, which hasn't actually really changed. <laughs> children are consumers, right, until they're much older. Well, I don't know, we're still paying on school loans, they're still consumers. But, but children didn't have a lot of economic value, so they were considered insignificant. 
That's interesting because we live in a culture where we value children, but they were insignificant. So walk with me through a couple stories from Mark 9, 38, because I want us to figure out where the disciples who have walked with Jesus for three years at this point, where they've gotten this kind of elitism thought and they've applied it to children. In Mark 9, 38, John says to Jesus, teacher, we saw someone using your name to cast out demons, but we told him to stop because he isn't from our group. Now see, that sounds a little bit like our modern day denominations, right? Sometimes we feel like we're in competition with other groups of believers. But the reality is Jesus became angry at this. It's like, no, he's, they're over there casting out demons in the name of Jesus. It's not evil what they're doing. They're just in a different group. Leave them alone, let them continue. They're doing God's work. But see how even John at that point thinks, well, they're not in our group. We're kind of better than them. We've got Jesus. Well, you have them in person for sure. And then a second story, Luke 9, 54. This takes place, actually, Jesus is getting ready to ascend to heaven. They're going to go to Jerusalem, and they're going to walk through a Samaritan village. And so Jesus says, please go ahead and let the Samaritans know that I'm coming so that they can get ready for me. So James and John go. And the Samaritans reject it. They say, oh, you're on your way to Jerusalem. Remember, the Jews and the Samaritans were not friends. You're on your way? Well, you can't come here. And so then John and James comes back, and this is what they said. They said, when John and James saw this, they said to Jesus, Lord, should we call down fire from heaven to burn them up? That seems a little extreme, <laughs> doesn't it? I mean, they're rejecting Jesus. That is a total bummer, but calling down fire from heaven, Wow. <laughs> And once again, Jesus is like, oh, you guys don't get it. In this passage, back to the passage with the children, the NIV says, and the, you can tell this is the um, New Living Translation because Mark uses the word angry. Jesus became angry with them. In the NIV, it says that Jesus became indignant with them, outraged. Now, if you think about the two stories we just walked through, I mean, obviously the disciples are full of fervor. They are excited to be with Jesus. They just want to save the world, but there's something they're missing and they get angry. Now, because only Mark records indignant, it's important we look at that. This is actually the only time that word is used in the gospels to describe Jesus's anger. So it's significant, sort of ironic too. The, going back to the story of the children, the disciples are angry because these parents are bringing their children to be blessed, and then Jesus is angry at them for not allowing the children to come. So what kind of anger are we talking about here? I mean, the reality is you can tell a lot about a person by what they get angry at. Anybody here today got angry on your way to church at somebody who cut you off or wasn't using their blinker and you had to slow way down? Maybe you spilt your coffee. Oh, somebody's giving me an example in the front. Thank you, Brandon. <laughs> right? Maybe your kids. I know, you know, when our granddaughters are with us and stuff is strewn all over and you step on something and it hurts, right? Does anybody get angry at those kinds of things? What, is, what are the disciples getting angry at? And what, are, what is Jesus getting angry at? It's important to look at that because believe it or not, there is something called righteous anger. And Jesus is trying to illustrate that. We need to get angry at the right things. So the disciples are getting angry because they're being inconvenienced or they just believe Jesus doesn't have enough time for these insignificant. Jesus, we've got limited time. Every village we go to, you're surrounded by people. You need to spend your time on the people that are most important. That's our strategy of ministry, right? And Jesus is saying, no, no. The most important people are the most insignificant. That's who I want to spend my time with. So rather than holding the children back, what should the disciples have been doing? Ushering them to the front, bringing them up. They were concerned about what appeared to be most important, and it wasn't most important to Jesus so what made him angry was that the disciples had missed his heart. They had missed what he cared about most. 
Jesus cares about the helpless, the weak, the vulnerable, the innocent. That's what he cares about. That's the heart of our God. And yet the disciples were concerned about the strong and the powerful and those that were most influential. We had, um, about 10 years ago, Matt and I were running a VBS in South County at the church we were at at the time, and we had a couple of the kids come up and share their story about the missions project and how they raised money and what happened, and these two little guys come up, like age four and age six, and um, they said, well, we had a lemonade stand, but our neighbor called the police on us. I'm like, whoa, I mean, wow, (laughs) this is a new one. And they said we were blocking the sidewalk, so she got angry and called the, called the police on us. And I said, oh man, what happened? He said, well, the police came and asked us what we were amazing, raising money for. And at that point, we were raising money to purchase stoves for um, a village in El Salvador where they didn't, have, um, they didn't have any clean fire burning or fuel burning stoves in their homes. And that's what we were raising money for. And so they told the police officers about it. And I said, then what did the police do? Well, they bought a glass of lemonade. (laughs) It's one of my favorite stories. And the police said, don't worry about it. I mean, the kids were only out there a few hours. But we need to be angry about the right things. Right? A couple kids raising money for some stoves in El Salvador for some people in a village that are very poor. Wow, the inconvenience of a blocked sidewalk for a couple hours, not the right thing to be angry about. Are you angry when you hear of a child being abused? Are you angry when you hear about people in the Caribbean who do not have clean water? Those are the things that God wants us to be angry about because our anger drives us towards compassion, hopefully. We don't want to blow anything up. (laughs) It needs to drive us in a positive construction way, constructive way towards compassion. And that's what Jesus is saying here. He's like, Guys, you've been with me all these years and you have missed the mark. You are angry about the wrong things. You need to be angry about what doesn't, doesn't serve people well, where people are being abused and they're neglected and they're poor. And that's why throughout scripture, what do we see, especially from Jesus' mouth? These words, take care of the widows, take care of the orphans, take care of those that are poor. And throughout the New Testament, So when he said, let the children come to me, don't stop them. For the kingdom of God belongs to those who are like these children. What do we think of? What does he mean? What is Jesus saying? We need to be like children. We had a little gal this week. She was sitting about right here. And Diana said, if anybody wants to have Jesus as their forever friend, come forward. And she just came right up. She stood right there. She was ready. And then a bunch of kids started coming up. And I don't know if you saw some of the pictures in the video, but it was such a sweet moment to see children respond to Jesus, to just come as they were called. You see, kids recognize they're helpless. They recognize they're inadequate. They recognize they need someone to lead them. They're not in control, that they're weak. And that's what Jesus wants from us. When we think we can run everything in our lives, when we think we're in control, we make enough money, we're good enough as people, then we don't need Jesus. When we recognize that we are not in control, that we are helpless without Christ, that we are weak except through the one who makes us strong, when we recognize those things, we can come to God as children and we will be able to receive him. And I believe that's what it's really saying, this passage is really saying. The the verse 15 also says, I tell you the truth or truly, right? One of those truly I say to you, one of those things where you're like, okay, whatever's gonna be, be said after I tell you the truth, you need to listen to. I tell you the truth, anyone who does not receive the kingdom of God like a child will not enter it. We must come before God as children and say, God, you are in control, we are not. We are sinners. I almost put a picture up of our dog because he's such a sinner. Now, I know (laughs) theologically that may not be totally right. (laughs) I do hope he's going to be in heaven, but he's a sinner. He eats chocolate. He doesn't even realize it's bad for him. We keep telling him it's bad for you, and he keeps eating it, and he's still with us. But when, we'll see. He's still with us. He's a big lab, so yeah, he's a really great guy. But we as people, what? (laughs) 
Oh. <laughs> we as people have to recognize our need for Jesus, right? I mean, there's lots of little ways that we don't recognize that, but every day as we wake up, dear Father in heaven, thank you for sending us your son, Jesus. Thank you that we cannot breathe a moment of air without you. That every single day, every single hour we live in this day, we want to live humbly before you, recognizing our weakness before you because you are the one that makes us strong. They introduced the last verse um, of VBS week, John 3, 16, and I love this verse. For this is how God loved the world. He gave us one and only son, so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. Everyone can have eternal life. We just simply need to come to Jesus, come before God as children. We are helpless, we are weak, we are vulnerable, we are not in control, and we need a God that we can trust so that you can be in control. You know, God is a friend to everyone. He's a friend to the weak, he's a friend to the strong, to the rich, the poor, the young, and the old. And I don't know if you noticed about our team, it was very diverse. It was a very multi-generational team, which was one of the greatest treats about this week to work with everyone. But if you today have not asked Jesus to be your forever friend, in kid language, you've not asked him to come and take over your heart, that you might be strong through your weakness because of Jesus. If you haven't asked him, then in a few minutes, we're gonna have the worship band, they're gonna come back up, the worship team, and they're gonna lead us in some more worship, and we're gonna have prayer workers on the side. You can come, stand in the front, you can kneel if you want. But this is an opportunity to ask Jesus to be your friend who will be with you anytime when you're happy or sad. You will never be alone when you have a friend like Jesus. So feel free to come up as we begin to worship. And um, anyway, we love you guys. Be sure and stop for a treat at the end. Dear Father in heaven, we love you. We stood before you earlier and we said you are worthy. You are the lamb. We come before you as a people and we say we want to be like children, recognizing our need for God, our need for someone who's stronger than us, who's smarter than us, who can see everything and can guide us, one that we can trust and, we, and also that we can recognize we are not in control, that you are in control and as long as we trust you, everything will be all right. We're just so grateful for the gift of your son, Jesus. He came and took our sins upon him that we might be saved from separation from you. We might have a friendship on this world, on this earth, because of Jesus, but also live eternally with you. Thank you, Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's worship everyone.